Welcome back to Menopause Mastery. So today, I, I promised last week that we were going to have this conversation, and so now I think it is time. You know, I've been in this industry for 20, going on 21 years, and universally, starting at about October 31st, what we see is people start to fall off. They fall off the schedule, they fall off the wagon, they become unhinged. And what I really want to talk about is how do we get back to balance, number one, but how do we sustain it to begin with? Because here's the reality. The average person gains seven to eight pounds over the course of October, the end of October through January 2nd. Right, seven to eight pounds on a midlife woman is very difficult to lose because we have metabolic effects of the loss of estrogen. We have a slowing of metabolism, an increase of inflammation, and particularly visceral fat, which is underneath your belly muscles, which create more inflammation, which makes you more insulin resistant, which is kind of self-fulfilling. And then we also have a lack of inertia. So one of the things that was very interesting in the research was that when we gain weight, regardless of where and how it happens, we not only gain weight, but hunger often becomes dysregulated. So the individual who is struggling with metabolic damage often does actually feel really hungry and it's because their cells are not efficiently burning fuel properly. And we have hormones like leptin that actually increase and we become less able to hear it in the brain. Leptin's made by our fat cells. It talks directly to the brain and tells you whether or not you need to store fat or not. It also tells us to store fat and also tells us, hey, why don't you get on the couch? It's dark out. You need to just watch some episodes of something on Netflix. Don't go be active. So let's talk about how to navigate the holidays with grace to be able to maintain the healthy habits we have now without feeling like we're completely deprived, right? So this show, we're going to explore some stories, some strategies, and ideas to help you thrive in all aspects of your life during the next couple months. Um, and for many of us, let's face it, the holiday season brings joy, connection, and celebration, but some of us, especially a lot of us who've had maybe a complicated relationship with food, it can also bring challenges, right? So let's be honest. We have cocktail parties and dessert buffets and indulgent feasts. We have abnormal schedules. We're staying up late and shopping or going to the mall or you know, trying to get in that last minute, you know, activities to make it through the holidays. So we have a Martha Stewart picture perfect experience. All of that is a hallmark of the holiday season, particularly in the United States, where it's become highly commercialized. And these indulgent things that we do during the holidays are not part of our everyday life. And for many people, the wheels come off the bus within the first couple weeks if, of November, if not earlier, and it is like no holds barred, everything goes to hell in the handbag until about mid-January. And a lot of people will start a New Year's resolution and you know, by the end of January 21st, three quarters of people have stopped and they're still trying to get back onto that change process. And if you've ever read Prochaska's Levels of Change or Stages of Change, when we go through change, we like to think of it as this linear experience. You know, I, I'm doing a habit that I don't want to do now. I just change, and then I'm automatically at the top of the, the, top of the change um, stage, and it's now a habit, and I no longer need to deal with it. Prochaska actually designed it as a spiral going upwards. And what he found when he was studying people's behavior change is that people spiraled up and down the spiral for each behavior multiple times. So for instance, to stop smoking, it took an average of 11 times up and down the, I shouldn't be smoking, I'm going to stop smoking, I'm thinking about stop smoking, I'm going to stop, I actually stop, I've stopped for a while, identify as I'm not smoking, and then all of a sudden we have one cigarette and we're right back down to where we were, and now I'm a smoker again, right? Except in, in these cases, it might be I am eating sugar, or I'm indulging in and desserts or cocktail parties or I'm having more wine at dinner or I'm not exercising anymore because I've fallen off of my habitual activities. So here's the thing. The holidays don't have to derail us. We also don't have to be stuck in a situation where we feel like we're being deprived. And in fact, they can be an opportunity to thrive and learn a new way of being. So the other thing is, is a diet will never work. 
a diet is a short term, usually somewhat, you know, structured, if not highly structured, change in eating to change a certain set of biomarkers and behaviors. It is not a lifestyle. And if I can tell you anything after having done this for more than 20 years, but lived as a female for 55 years now, is by this time in life, I don't want to be on a diet. I don't want to have to count calories, pay attention, worry about whether it's a carbohydrate or not, or what's the latest science and research that tells me I can and can't have something. Now, the reality is there are certain foods that add to your health, like getting protein first, high fiber, hydration, all of those things. There's nobody here questioning the value of those. The science is absolutely clear. However, the gamesmanship we play with ourselves and with our science to enable us to maneuver and start something and stop something is often where we end up just feeling like we're going crazy and we want to break the cycle. So let's start first about how to break a cycle. And it's that common pattern of being off the wagon eating. You know, and again, like I said, it starts in Halloween and one small exception sort of snowballs into another. And then before you know it, you're snowballing and snowballing and snowballing. So here's the catch. Every time we repeat this cycle of stopping and starting, stopping and starting, we make it harder to break free the next time. So why? Because our brains are wired to respond to the habits we reinforce. So when you start and stop, I'm going to eat healthy and take care of myself. I'm going to exercise appropriately and, you know, do self-care. And then all of a sudden I stop it and I keep going back and forth. We're reinforcing neural pathways in our brain to say we start and stop these things. And that stopping is the next inevitable thing. And if we use the holidays as an excuse to bend or break the habits we are trying or the food plan or the healthy living we're doing because we want to live a healthy lifespan, we're setting ourselves up for a harder struggle next year. So the stopping and starting is part of that challenge because, again, our brain is going to reinforce the pattern that it sees. And the solution isn't about perfection. That's not really realistic. And that's the other thing is, you know, I have people who go, I'm never, ever touching sugar again. And I'm like, okay, how long is that lasting? Right? How long is that truly lasting? Yeah, could there be an outlier person out there that's like, okay, I haven't had sugar in two years? Yeah, but they're rare and few and far between. And it's highly unlikely that most people would be successful. So it's not about per per perfection. It's really about awareness and self-compassion. And it's also understanding and striving for healthy behaviors that compound over time. Striving for perfection will only lead to burnout. And what we can do is change the narrative, what we say to ourselves. Instead of seeing the holidays as a time to indulge, we can reframe them as an opportunity to connect, to truly connect with what matters most. And this is one of the most successful things that my menopause mastery, um, metabolism mastery ladies do is they start to redefine the holidays and celebrations and family dinners and all those things about the connection and the experience, not about grandma's pie, right? It's about what truly means to meet around a table and have community, which is what eating has evolved to. It's not just fueling, but it's a way to commune. It's a way to have experiences. And if we focus more on that, then the food carries less weight. So the first step in navigating the holidays with grace is we have to master our mindset, right? Your inner saboteur will often show up and it'll whisper things in your ear like, Betty, you deserve that extra dessert. You deserve that chocolate oh, it's only one time, you're only going to have a few pieces. How can you possibly stick to your plan during the holidays? What is your mom going to say if you don't eat X, Y, and Z? What is so-and-so going to see if you don't try their dessert? We have to recognize those thoughts for what they are. They are tricks our mind plays on us to derail our progress and to take us back to the reinforced behavior we have done repeatedly, which is we stop and start and we put food up on a pedestal in a way that has nothing to do with the food. The food happens to just be there. We took food and put it into the place of 
focus rather than the experience of the people we're with and our own experiences. So here's the powerful truth. If you stick to your plan, yes, even on Thanksgiving or New Year's, it can actually make your holiday more enjoyable. Enjoyable. Why? Because you're aligning with your bigger goals. And when you succeed, you build trust in yourself. And you also reinforce those neural pathways that tell your brain, hey, I can continue to do these healthy things because they help me, right? How does it make your holiday more enjoyable? Has anybody had a bender where they went and ate a bunch of things, they told themselves they weren't going to eat, the foods you said is not on my list, and I'm air quoting that, and let's say you did it anyway, how'd you feel the next morning? How'd you really feel? Because I know pretty much universally the clients and tens of thousands of women we've seen over 20 years is and men guaranteed there's a level of shame and distrust and anger with ourselves because we did not keep our contracts that we make with ourselves, right? So let's take a little exercise. Take a moment to reflect on how your inner saboteur has been at work recently. Have you been tempted to make exceptions because it's a special occasion? Or have you been tempted to have that extra glass of wine because you had more on your plate today and it's been a busier day and harder to deal with? Or maybe you decided that the holidays are just too hard to navigate. So why bother? You know, fuck it. I'm just going to wait until the end of January and then I'm going to start, right? I'm just going to give it all up. So I'm going to throw away probably an entire year's of worth of healthy behaviors, spiral all the way to the bottom of the, the entire spiral to try and dig myself out because I've given up on the holidays, right? So imagine your saboteur. What are they saying? Because they're saying something. And often it's not even our voice. It might be our mother's voice. It might be um, people we know. It might be, you know, mean girls from school. It may not even be your voice, but there's a voice inside there, the saboteur, that's talking to you in your subconscious. Now, I want you to flip the script. Imagine staying on track. Imagine waking up on Christmas Day or Hanukkah or whatever you're celebrating and you go down and you're meeting your family, you're seeing everybody, oh my gosh, aunt so-and-so who you haven't seen for forever is there. You hug them, maybe some grandbabies show up that you didn't know you could, were gonna see. Maybe the dog is being super cute and has a nice little holiday outfit on. Like, embrace all that. And then imagine yourself getting up that morning and exercising before everybody gets there because you want to make sure you have good energy throughout the day. Your heart's pumping, your brain feels nice and nourished, and you have uh, endorphins running around your body. And then you break your fast with a nice protein meal. Maybe it's a protein shake with you know fruits and fiber, so it's easy and not going to be super filling, but your protein's on board, so your blood sugar stays balanced, and you walk into the table where the spread of food is there. And you look at it, and you kind of decide, hey, I'm going to stay on track. I'm going to eat pretty healthy today. And I already started out, and I've done three things at least that I've already should have, that were on my should list, right? I exercised, I hydrated, and I actually had a protein shake. So I kept my commitments to myself. And when we keep our commitments to ourselves, it's the same as keeping the commitment to the person you never ever want to break a commitment to. But we do it all the time to ourselves. So imagine now staying on track and how you feel. Right? Like we wake up in the morning and when we exercise, do you know why early morning exercisers are more successful than those that exercise at different times during the day? There's nothing magical about the morning. Actually, sometimes we feel a little more stiff, a little more like creaky. We maybe aren't as strong. I know I'm not as strong early in the morning. The reason why they're more successful is because they get it done and nobody can take it away from them. Right? So when we stay on track and we stack healthy behaviors, we feel more empowered right? And I guarantee you, you feel more empowered. You know, Thanksgiving is just a Thursday that we applied a story to. You don't need a sugar laden treat. You don't need four pounds of mashed potatoes with butter and gravy. You don't need those things to have the holiday. The holiday is more about the experience of the people we're with, right? It's about making it meaningful about the experience, right? So food isn't the star of the holiday. What is? It's gratitude, service, connection. Let's break it down. So gratitude. 
So one of the things I have people do, I do this as well, and I fall off the wagon. I you know, do it for a while, and then all of a sudden I realize I haven't been writing down things I'm grateful for. But particularly around the holidays, this is a really good time to get in the habit of charting something you're grateful for. Three, all you need is three. Three very simple, I'm grateful for. Three things every day, right? It's really good if you can start your day with it and really good if you can end it because it helps frame your mind. It also helps bring forward the energy and put you in a different vibration so you can attract the good things in your life. Now, if you're at a party, right, and you're feeling tempted, take a quick break, step away, and jot down, I don't care if it's a cocktail and napkin in the bathroom, jot down a gratitude list again right? Maybe it's just one or two things. I'm grateful for my Aunt Susie who made it here. I'm grateful for the grandbabies that showed up and they're so darn cute and they were so funny and I'm so grateful I was here to see it. Gratitude has been scientifically proven to bolster willpower and improve mood. And if you listen to my episode where I talked about the willpower gap and how our decision making is not logical, our decision making is not made by the prefrontal cortex, that part of the brain that's really logical. It's made by this limbic system of our brain and it's driven by what we call bottom-up processing, which is emotion and senses and other things. When you take a moment to step into gratitude and slow everything down, what you do is you bring that, that sort of behind-the-scenes messaging that's going through your brain and elucidate it to the to the front of the mind and it also adds a pattern interrupt to allow your brain to say whoa cool yeah I've got way more here to be excited about than the pie that's sitting on the table right so let's talk about service so shifting your focus to giving right whether it's helping out in the kitchen playing with the kids or volunteering or just giving time energy and focus service creates meaningful memories that have nothing to do with food right? Maybe you're helping out at a meal kitchen. Maybe you're helping a fellow family member that's in need. Those times when people give to others selflessly are the memories that they make. I promise you, you are not going to be waxing and waning about somebody's pie five years from now, but you might very well be on your deathbed talking about the time that you helped out at a food kitchen and saw some amazing transformations for people. So small acts, like even paying for somebody's coffee or helping clean up can have a huge impact. So thinking of the holidays as being a time of gratitude and service. Connection. True connection happens through conversation and presence. Not over plates of food, right? Sitting down over your food, mowing through it like you're a lawnmower is not a genuine experience of connection chatting over your meal, having a good conversation, laughing, listening, and staying present is, right? This is the season to deepen those relationships and ask meaningful questions like, what's been your greatest challenge this year? What things are you grateful for? Not just how long did it take to, for you to get here? You driving back tonight. What about the snow? Leave the cursory bullshit to another time. Maybe ask some more challenging and more appropriate questions to get to know somebody on a deeper level. And hey, you know, it's, it's not always easy, right? So here's, here's the sidebar that I also like to talk about is we can choose our friends and we can't choose the family we were born to, but we can choose the family we spend time with. So sometimes we may be very different than the people we were born into the family with, right? That's genetics, that's biochemicals. It's not necessarily a definition of who you are. So you could be very different than your family. I happen to be adopted. There was no question that I was different behaviorally than my family. My brother is adopted too, and he and I are like night and day, but we have some similarities in like music and, and things like that. We also have very childish humor. Um, I can have some dark and childish humor from time to time, but we're different in personalities. And sometimes people have family of origin that don't support your ideas that don't support what's important to you, that aren't loving and protective and connecting. And, you know, one of the beauties of this time period of life is we have no more Fs to give. Fuck it. You know what? If, the, if you have people in your life that you've been obligated to that you no longer want to spend time with because they don't lift you up, they harm you more than help you, or they are not there for your greatest good, this might be a good time to create new traditions. That's one of my favorite quotes from my father-in-law. 
he uh, he was actually dying of cancer, but one of the things that he said was, I think it's time for you to create your own traditions. And, you know, part of his reason for saying that is, I know I'm not going to be here. But the other part was, it was also, hey, you need Part of it was, hey, you need to step out and create the traditions that are meaningful and loving to you and your family of choice, not necessarily family of origin. You know, um, a lot of people, I've, I've lived in the deep south and you hear all the time, blood's thicker than water. And I'm like, yeah, but blood isn't always life-saving on the ground, right? So just because you're related to somebody genetically and biochemically, it does not mean that you have to spend time with them, especially if they are no longer supporting you in a way that's helpful, meaningful, and loving, right? And this might be the perfect time to say, hey, I'm going to shift how I spend my time and who I spend it with to people who really care and love me, right? That's hard. But once you exercise that boundary muscle a little bit, or maybe you do it a little bit less, you know, maybe instead of spending two or three days with somebody, you spend a couple hours, you know, you slowly break the pattern. If you're spending time with people that make you feel terrible, that's not holiday. And I would bet money that food becomes a shelter and comfort and in an inappropriate way when that stuff happens, right? Or alcohol, right? There's, there's some other drug that's going to play proxy for covering up how you feel, right? So here would be a good place to also set some boundaries, right? And get the connection with people you really love. Building resilience, right? So how do we build this resilience when the party's over, right? The days after the holidays are also critical. Re-entry into everyday life requires care and planning. Um, you've used willpower during celebrations, right? So you've said, okay, I'm going to participate. And I'm going to talk about some very specific things about kind of my ways of participating and the balancing act of not being highly restrictive, but also balancing my healthy behaviors. Um, but you also need to give yourself space to recharge, right? So the other part is getting enough sleep and protecting your sleep cycle and your, your schedule taking a walk, clearing your schedule and focusing on self-care. Self-care is not getting a massage. It is, right? But self-care, what we're talking about here, is something that you do on a more daily basis. It's the things that you do to, to support your body, your health, and your well-being. Whether it's a bubble bath, reading a good book, taking a moment to reflect, writing in a gratitude journal, you know, sitting in a sauna, cold plunge, taking a few moments of meditation, prayer, yoga, actually taking time to prepare food, right? Healthy food for yourself. Those are all self-care things and a little bit of planning can make the difference. And here's the thing. So what if you slip up, right? So I hear that all the time. Oh, I had good intentions and then I didn't really pay attention. Then all of a sudden I slipped up and I screwed up that night. So here's the thing, a single decision. So let's say you went to a party and you hit the buffet and you ate a lot more than you wanted to do. Cool. Whatever, right? Did somebody die? No. Did the world come to an end? No. Is there going to be a nuclear holocaust? No. Here's the cool thing. What happens the next couple hours, probably by the next morning? You're going to decide to eat again. And that's what's more important. It's how do I respond to that? So the next minute I pick up a fork or the next minute I wake up and I have a choice on whether to do a little bit of self-care is a moment of choice that I can just like let go. I had one little indiscretion. So I think of it as like a, an elementary school grade, like my husband was telling me, he had an English teacher that would literally keep deducting points and you could have negative points on a paper. And I was like, oh, that's awful, right? What kind of story does that tell a child? Like you must be perfect or you could be just negative worth, right? So a single decision doesn't define you. And if I make that one indiscretion and maybe I had a bunch of chocolate I didn't plan on doing because I was at that party and I just sort of shifted back into old behavior, that's like getting a 99.9. .9. That's a 1%, right? Or 0.1 in this particular case. It's like one little tiny thing in the grand scheme of the big ocean of your life. And all I have to do the next morning or the next time I sit down or I reach for something is I just go, gosh, I'm, what would I have done if this was Tuesday three weeks ago? Oh, okay. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. Drink a glass of water. Have protein in the morning. Work out. Whatever that is. Acknowledge the, the misstep. Reflect on it and move forward. There's no reason to bash yourself. There's no reason to have shame because we've got to sack the self-sabotage, right? So let's talk about it. This often stems, self-sabotage does, from a deeply ingrained belief like 
We don't deserve health, happiness, attention, focus, love, awareness. We're fearing the changes that come to reaching our goals. There are so many things that the self-saboteur in your brain runs with, right? And to break free from those, we need to identify those beliefs and ask yourself, what may, must be true in my life for self-sabotage to exist? Right, so what has to be true? I want to ask that again. What has to be true in my life for self-sabotage to exist? Right? Well, here's some of the things that we do know. Often when people self-sabotage, it's because they have their focus shift on history, negativity, and what we did wrong rather than celebrating what we did right. Right? And a, a sense of deep underworth. And it can also be a sense of really poor sense of self. But at the very basics, we focus on the negative rather than celebrating wins. And you got to remember, as animals, we were designed to do that because it kept us safe, right? So we are wired to do that. We're not, nobody is out here being Pollyanna and not seeing the things that we do, air quoting, wrong. But we have to remember to celebrate the wins and not focus on every single minutia of where we were not perfect. Because you're human, you won't be. Impossible, never going to happen, right? So that makes discipline feel out of reach. If we are constantly focusing on the things that we did wrong or we aren't just quite perfect at, right? Because discipline around the things that we hold dear, taking care of ourselves, self-care, exercising appropriately for our body, eating healthy foods to help us be healthy, those are the disciplines that actually bring us freedom because we aren't being eat up all day with self-sabotage, shame, and victimhood and all those other feelings that take us into a shame spiral. And the good news is these beliefs can be rewritten. We can start small. We can celebrate those little positive things. So just like the gratitude journal, we can write down a positive thing. I woke up this morning when my alarm went off and I actually meditated for five minutes. That's a huge celebration. If you normally hit snooze, like, and today you didn't do it, celebrate it, right? Because when we celebrate, that helps rewire the brain to tell you, hey, this is valuable. I need to do more of it. And you deserve health, happiness, and connection. You got to remember that. You do. Now, let's talk at some very basic stuff about mindful eating. So mindful eating gets a lot of press in a lot of different ways. There's people online going, oh, I just eat mindfully, so I just wait until my body tells me what I need to eat, and that's what I eat. Well, we have to remember hormonally, neurotransmitter-wise, brain neurochemistry-wise, there are a lot of things that can cause your body's natural hunger singles, even your genetics, to give you somewhat muddled or inappropriate direction, right? I talked about one of them at the very beginning, changes to leptin levels that tell your brain, hey, you need to eat and store fat. And hey, become more sedentary because I want to store fat. That's a hormone your body makes doing that, right? So mindful eating is about tuning into your body's clues and creating a supportive environment to hear your body's hunger signals and full signals, right? So one of the ways that I have found to be very effective is true hunger we often feel in our stomach area. So kind of below your bra line or right around your bra line, you get kind of a gnawing sort of gurgling hunger. If you're feeling that hunger up in your throat or in some other part of your body, like, but a lot of times people will explain it like up in the upper chest or throat, that's not true hunger. That's psychological hunger. True hunger will have like a rumbling of the tummy, right? We want to eat when we're hungry, but not starving. And we want to eat till we are about 20 to 30% full, right? It's called harahachibu, right? And that's eating until we are 80% full, not 100%, not to where we're overstuffed and we feel like we might barf a little bit, right? So we want to eat when we're hungry, not starving. If you're white knuckling it and you can't wait and you're starting to get hypoglycemic feeling or hangry, all bets are off. You've just turned on all these hormonal messages to tell your body to eat more and store it, right? So we want to eat appropriately. And so often this means eating three times a day. And if you're doing intermittent fasting, not creating such narrow windows that you are getting one of those, you know, kind of white knuckling it experiences all the time, right? And then eating and aiming for about, you know, 20 to 30% away from full, right? You want to slow down. 
chew your food. I cannot begin to tell you how many times we do stool tests and we see food left over in the stool because people aren't chewing, right? We can see fibers from your vegetables in the, food, in the stool because it's not getting digested, right? We want to chew and we want to savor our food. You want to let it sit across the palate of the tongue and touch all parts of the tongue because different parts of the tongue turn on different parts of taste, sweet and sour and salty. Those are different regions on the tongue. Let your food pass over it. Um, mindful eating is also about how you eat, right? It's about being at a table, being present to your food, not scrolling on Instagram, watching TV with a TV tray in front of you on a couch, right? Or is cramming a cheeseburger down your throat while you're driving kids around for soccer practice. It's about actually being aware of and attentive to your food. The other thing is, is your children, if you have small children around you, maybe grandchildren or some people might have younger children, they follow what you do, not what you say. So if they see you pound your food and overindulge and talk about shame and all that other stuff, they're going to follow in your footsteps. They're not going to listen to what you say. They're going to listen and do what you do. That we know that. How many, how many kids grew up in a smoker's household that at some point during their childhood said they hated smoking, it was terrible, but they smoked anyway? I did when I was a teenager. And I complained about it when I was a little kid. And I still smoked when I was in high school, right? Stupid. I knew it wasn't healthy for you, but I'd do it anyway. Yeah, because I'm an idiot, right? Because you're dumb at that age. But your kids, your kids are going to follow your behavior, not your talk, right? So if we get a chance to slow down, eat in presence, and, and pay attention to the act of eating, we're less tempted to overindulge. Because it also helps our satiety hormones, things like ghrelin and glucagon and leptin, and all those hormones respond that help tell our body, hey, you're full, you're done, you don't need any more, right? So you want to eat slower so your body can catch up to you. And so finally, let's talk about planning for success, right? So in the bodybuilding world, there's an idea of cheat meals. And if anybody's ever done periodization or macro rotations, we've heard cheat meals. And cheat meals can work, but they need boundaries, right? So a cheat meal means you eat for your health X amount of times per week. My general rule is 80% of the time you eat to, according to your healthy eating plans that's helping you achieve the goal you have long term. Now, the cheat meal is then 20% of the time. So what does that translate to? It usually translates to two meals out of the entire week, right? And it allows you to consider which meals are the cheat meal, right? So if you're going out five times this week because it's a holiday party every single time a week, that is not a reason to indulge in anything and everything as a free-for-all for five days straight, and especially not all day long. You won't feel good, number one, and by the time you're done with that, chances are the self-sabotage and the shame will kick in, and you'll be off kind of the wagon for a long time. So cheat meals can help, and here's what I like to think of is, especially, and I do this during the week too, it's I pick my poison, right? So what would constitute cheating, right? A cheat meal. It might be alcohol, a margarita, a champagne, a glass of wine. It might be dessert. It might be the bread basket, right? So what I choose is which one of those treats do I want? It doesn't mean I get the bread basket and the glass of wine or two and the dessert, right? I don't get all three of those things. I get one of those. Because what really happens when you do all three? By the time you get to the dessert, do you taste anything after the first couple bites? No. Chances are you're so overfull, you feel disgusting. You might even feel kind of nauseated. You can't even enjoy what you're eating. So you want to think, which one of these indulgent treats could I have? Because one of them is not going to break the bank, but I can savor it and enjoy it and experience it. And then I balance the rest of my plate with half the plate being non-starchy vegetables, plenty of protein, and I probably also look at the things like gravies, sauces, and other things because that's where you get a ton of calories out of nowhere in restaurant and celebration sittings, right? And especially big, big meals where they're feeding a lot of people, there's always sauces and it's because they don't have to be as particular about the temperature and the cooking range on the food. If they bury it in a sauce, you can't tell it's dried out. Right, So having sauces on the side or grilled or eating a healthier version of those other items so you could really enjoy that indulgent single item that you really, really wanted. 
right? And remember, treats are more meaningful when they're occasional and savor them. Then when the meaning's over, focus on the people, the laughter, the connections. Even while you're there, focus on that, right? If you're getting pressure from family members to eat, you always, all of us have, especially those friends, you have the friends that are like, oh man, I know if we go out, we're going to start out with a cheese plate. We're going to have four, four bottles of wine and then we're going to have dessert. You know who I'm talking about, right? You have also the friends that will take you shopping and all of a sudden you have blown your budget five times over, right? We all have those friends, right? If you're getting pressure from those individuals, just explain to them, just say, hey, I'm here to experience my time with you, right? And I am having a, tr a treat, but I'm just having this one because I want to really be with you and be with this experience, right? Most of the time, that'll shut people down. It really will, right? It really, really will, right? So the holiday season is an opportunity for you to reframe how you see food, celebrations, and yourself, right? And yourself. And it can be this extraordinarily huge, empowering experience that can actually make you stronger starting the following year. And when we focus on gratitude, service, connection, and quieting our saboteur, telling her to go home and shut up, you move through the season with joy and confidence. You don't end up in a shame spiral and you actually enjoy the holidays at a greater experience. It doesn't have to be a fight and it doesn't have to be wheels off. It really doesn't. So I hope you found this to be a very helpful episode as we head into the last part of the holiday season and New Year's. And thank you for turning in to Menopause Mastery Podcast. If you found it helpful, please share it with a friend who might need some hol holiday inspiration. And don't forget to subscribe. And I'll see you next time.